Yes, here in Switzerland, we actually have atomic bunkers. But you know we are practical folks. Why waste a perfectly good underground fortress waiting for a nuclear doom when it can double as a car parking and as the home for our smart meters? A nod to Batman's secret lair, if you will. Today's engineering challenge is clear. Can I successfully capture the smart meter signals buried deep beneath layers of reinforced concrete and stream that data to my Grafana dashboard? Will I impress you with Swiss ingenuity or will I end up banging my head against the walls of the bunker? Stick around because either way it's going to get interesting. In the unlikely event of success, I'll have created a prototype for a long-distance MQTT message extender. Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with a Swiss accent, bringing you a new episode with fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. Remember, if you subscribe, you'll always sit in the first row. Fortunately, Switzerland has a law granting homeowners the right to access their smart meter data. So the mission today involves solving three key problems. How to access the smart meter data. How to transport the data from the bunker to my home. Given the bunker walls, this is the bottleneck and therefore needs to be solved first. How to integrate this data into my Home Assistant and Grafana dashboard. How would you solve the problem, particularly the data transport? Let's start with the smart meter itself. It is an E450 from Landis and Gear, which offers both an optical and a wired MBUS interface. While reading the optical interface is an option, I choose MBUS not only for data, but also because it provides power for the interface. So what exactly is MBUS? MBUS, short for meter bus, is a communication protocol designed for the remote reading of utility meters for electricity, gas, water and heat. In its wired form it uses an RG12 connector with six pins. Two of these pins handle data transmission using a differential signal operating between 24 and 36 volts. With a clever design this voltage can even be used to power your reader. I decided to keep things simple by purchasing a G Plug M dongle which uses the smart meter interface of Tasmota to send MQTT messages. Powered by an ESP32C3 chip, it uses Wi-Fi for data transmission. Now let's see how Wi-Fi holds up in a bunker. As you might expect, the signal barely makes it through the bunker's thin inner walls. It's almost as if this setup was designed for clandestine transmitter experiments. What other possibilities exist? Cellular networks are ubiquitous these days, so let's test with my smartphone next. While smartphones primarily use frequencies around 2 GHz, they also utilize sub GHz bands which are particularly beneficial in rural areas because lower frequencies theoretically have a longer range and better penetration into obstacles. Unfortunately, even this option disappoints. So what's next? The legal options for free ISM bands in Europe are 868 and 433 MHz. There are lower ISM bands available, however, they are mainly used for remote controlled planes. Given that I've successfully used the 433 MHz band for my mailbox sensor placed in a Faraday cage, let's stick with what's proven and try LoRa, which is known for its long range and low power, albeit with lower data rates. Considering our smart meter updates every 5 seconds, LoRa speed should be ok. I'll be using two standard LoRa 32 boards for my first tests. I will transmit random data from the bunker and try to pick it up in our home. If it works we can continue. If not, we will need to explore another option. Or give up. 
I'm optimistic, so I'll start testing with the fastest setting, SF7. If we hit the wall, there is always the option to lower the speed and boost penetration. For better results, I borrowed a longer antenna from my ham radio transmitter. But there is another problem. My wife. She doesn't care about LoRa experiments and thinks my bunker adventures are a bit silly. So she will not be available to check the results on the receiver. My solution? Utilize the fact that every LoRa module is a two-way transceiver. The device at home will not only listen for incoming signals, but will also send back the signal strength of the incoming message to me in the bunker. This way, I can do all the tests alone without annoying my wife. As always, I'm using the famous Radiolip for these tests. After several tests, it's getting through. The signal quality varies depending on my position, but it's enough to move forward. With the bottleneck solved, it's time to design the overall solution. The Tasmota dongle reads the MBUS data and connects to an MQTT broker via an access point. So we have to build a simple access point to receive MQTT messages. To get the dongle to send MQTT messages, we have to add a basic MQTT broker to the AP. I call this milking the dongle strategy. The content of the MQTT messages is then transformed into LoRa packets, which are transmitted over our bunker signal connection. The home receiver converts these packets back into MQTT messages and sends them to the real Mosquito on my home automation server. From there, the data flows via Node-RED into InfluxDB and is displayed in Grafana. You see, this is an MQTT extender for harsh environments. Instead of the standard scenario where I connect the MBUS dongle to my home's Wi-Fi, I insert this newly created MQTT extender. It's a classic case of a simple problem evolving into a complex solution. Even if some viewers do not like it, ChatGPT as a co-pilot sped up the creation of the transmitter and receiver sketches. First I asked for a sketch that creates an access point and mimics a minimal MQTT server. It saved me from having to read through all the MQTT specifications. After some trials, the dongle was convinced, it was connected to a real MQTT server and began delivering messages. Cool! By the way, for this sketch I used two RTOS tasks synchronized by a queue. This helped to structure the code. To save precious airtime, I had to compress the data into a structure of floating point variables. Even if we do not use LoRaWAN, we must adhere to the 1% airtime rule of the ISM bands. Because this device is mains powered, I 3D printed a case around the USB plug and added a backup battery, just in case someone needs the outlet for a while. The home receiver is simpler. It receives the packet and converts it into a standard JSON formatted MQTT message. For monitoring, it also adds the signal strength values. Given that the bunker signal is weak and susceptible to interference, the receiver sends an acknowledged signal upon successful decoding. If the bunker transmitter doesn't receive this ACK, it continues to retransmit the package, dramatically reducing the risk of data loss. Finally, the MQTT messages are forwarded via Mosquito to Node-RED, where I perform some calculations and store the results in InfluxDB. Now everything is visible in Grafana. Success! Since the bunker connection is already bidirectional, adding a return channel is a no-brainer. For example, I could include data for the car charger directly in the Acknowledge packet. Those who think we are finished now do not know that, like always on this channel, we want more. Motivated by the success of the first trial, I decided to see if the whole concept could work with LoRaWAN. 
I already have a gateway on my roof, so I just needed to swap out the bunk transmitter. LoRaWAN operates at 868 MHz and uses an ALOA protocol, which means there is no back channel for requesting retransmissions. In other words, if a packet is lost, it's lost forever. Will it still work? Fortunately, Radiolib now supports LoRaWAN 2. So replacing the LoRa transmission with LoRaWAN was straightforward. I could remove CRC checking since that's built into the LoRaWAN protocol and ARQ wasn't even possible. Naturally, I switched to an 868 MHz version of the LoRa 32 board and with the LoRaWAN gateway handling the receiving end, no separate receiver was needed. Radiolip also supports automatic adaption of the transmission speed, which made me curious about which spreading factor the network will choose. First tests show that even at 868 MHz, the LoRa protocol can punch a hole through the bunker walls on SF9, the same factor I had to choose for a reliable connection on 433 MHz. To avoid any discussions with Johan from TTN about data volumes, I average 12 EMBOS packages and transmit only one LoRaWAN package per minute. Because the LoRaWAN package contains only floating point numbers, we have to create an uplink payload formatter that converts it back to JSON. Nothing special if you ask ChatGPT. Its first trial worked. Let's wrap up the lessons learned from this extensive project. LoRa to the rescue. LoRa enabled a reliable data connection from a bunker, a solution that's equally applicable in urban settings with tall buildings or in case where Wi-Fi fails to bridge distances between an MQTT transmitter and receiver. Versatility in frequency and protocols. Both a one-to-one -one connection on 433 MHz and a LoRaWAN connection on 868 MHz proved effective. The bunker transmitter. A key idea is the bunker transmitter, which milks the MQTT messages from the dongle and transmit condensed data via LoRa messages. Receiver options. On the receiving end we had two approaches. A home-built device that converts the LoRa messages back into standard MQTT messages. A LoRaWAN gateway that sends the data directly to the Things network. Payload formatter for TTN. For TTN, we developed a payload formatter that transforms the condensed LoRa packets into standard JSON messages. The overall impact? While this was an extensive and intricate project, it solved a critical problem for my setup and provided a wealth of learning experiences along the way. Maybe also for you? That was all for today. As always, you find all the relevant links in the description. If you found this video useful or interesting, please support the channel. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.